Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 454. The business of healthcare depends on the exploitation of doctors and nurses. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moffin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health, and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moffin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. So this was an, uh, this title is the title of an editorial that was recently in the uh, New York Times. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, written by Dr. Danielle Offrey, uh, who practices at Bellevue Hospital in New York. And mm-hmm. I want to start with one of her concluding statements. Mm-hmm. She says, from 1975 to 2010, 10 years ago, the number of healthcare administrators increased 3,200%. There percent. are now roughly 10 administrators in the hospital systems for every doctor that they have. That's said if amazing. we converted even half of those salary lines to additional nurses and doctors, we might have enough clinical staff to handle the work. That so would be- her argument is doctors are getting burnt out, nurses even more damaging uh, in her argument, because nurses do most of the minutia care mm-hmm. of a patient in a hospital. Mm-hmm. The doctors come in, they have the responsibility for making decisions about what's going on and ordering treatments and ordering medicines, but the administration of that, the mechanical process mm-hmm. of that, is done by the nurses. The nurses are employees of the hospital in general, uh-huh. but doctors are not always employees of the hospital. ER, yes, maybe some doctors in the OR like anesthesia, but in general, the doctors that go to a hospital and deliver services there, like do surgery on or staff, deliver babies on called? staff is okay. what it's called, aren't hospital employees. They're not paid by the hospital. They're not paid anything by the hospital, but they're required to be on committees And to bring their patients there, they have their cases reviewed by another committee. And they're required sometimes to take ER calls. So so be on committees. The hospital has committees Committees. like the M&M committee that meets every month. And if you're a doctor, you have to show up and be a part of some of those committees. M&M is morbidity and mortality. Right. But now they have computer, you know, the computer or the EMR EMR committees. And they have have lots of different kinds of committees. Right. That you and you don't get the option of saying, oh, I want to be a part of that. No. If you're a doctor, there's like, show up for yeah, this Yeah, this meeting. is yours. This is yours. You have to be huh. here, you know, or you better have a good reason. Right. Yeah. So, it's like teachers. Right. So, so it's an unpaid mandate by the hospital. Right. So it's another thing you have to do instead of taking care of patients. And then they also shift the work from like... 10 years ago when this study ended in 2010, they had, we had an EMR at our big, biggest hospital, and they fired all of the secretaries in every floor of the hospital. They accept ICU. So the secretaries are usually the people that take the doctor's the chart with all the written orders or the typed orders or the, e, or the EMR orders, and they put them in. They make them happen. So, so I'm in the hospital as a patient. You come into my room and see me. You sit down with the chart, and you talk to me about what your thoughts are, what my symptoms are, how I I'm I examine feeling. you. I make sure everything is And you make okay, notes of all that. And I make notes. And then you take it out and hand it to the secretary who transcribes it and puts it in the record. No. I hand it to the secretary. It's already written by me. Okay. Hand it to the secretary, and they then take my orders, which is on a specific sheet, like right. um, advance the diet from clear liquids to normal diet, uh, okay. get get her up in a chair three times a day, or you know that right. kind of thing. And I have like maybe twenty orders, so I would write them down while I'm talking to the patient, so I can remember everything. Sure. Then I would hand it to the secretary, and she would then go through all the manipulations of getting it into the EMR, then being sent to the different places. Like if a patient needed blood emergently, so you send something to I the would lab, give it to the secretary. To the nu- nutritional uh, section. Yeah. You... So they would send it to wherever it has to go. Physical therapy, And if whatever. it's an emergency, yeah. I'm taking care of the patient, right? Right. But the secretary would be putting in blood orders. I need to get blood. I mean, I had a circumstance when it first started where I was in the OR and somebody needed blood. She, I had to take her back to the OR, but beforehand she needed to have blood. Right. So 
no secretary. I, I couldn't figure out how to get the blood order in. Uh -huh. I called on the phone. No one answered. I had to leave the patient, walk down to the blood bank, and literally bang on the door to get somebody to come yeah. and talk to me. And they said, you have to have the order in. And I called the, the nurse on call for the whole hospital. She didn't show up. So I had somebody help me. In the meantime, the patient's me. waiting. Patient's bleeding. Yeah. And I need blood. to take her to the OR. Yeah. So I'm doing all of these things because the hospital wanted to save money on the secretaries and dump it on the doctors who, I mean, it's not a good good plan. Dump it on the doctors who aren't trained to do this and are doing something else at the same time. Yeah. Plus, it takes more time out of our day away from patients. We have our own EMR at the hospital. I mean, at the office, we have to know their EMR and then how to do everything. It would triple my time in the hospital. Now, I don't know what's happening now. I do know that that's hap that happened in 2010. That was my last straw to leaving the hospital. I just went, I can't, I can't take care of people this way. So a friend of mine whose wife is a physician was telling me that they have an EMR program mm -hmm. that they use at her office, mm -hmm. and then there's a different EMR yeah. at each of the hospitals that she goes right. to that Me she too. has to know. Yeah, I had that too. So you have to know what the, it's like switching from an Apple uh, computer to a Mac, mm -hmm. uh, into a, uh, a Word, mm -hmm. uh, a, a PC, Windows. Thank mm -hmm. you, PC. Uh, the way that the thing moves, the way the programs come up, the everything you do, everything is, is different. different, and so you have to have mm -hmm. learning time, and you have different you have different passwords. And the passwords have to change every six weeks. And, and you it have can't to, be anything you've used in the last year. Yeah. They have to have and, so many letters and so many symbols. And, and so I'd many be numbers. sitting there going, what is yeah. that password? I mean, and you're you know, not supposed to write them down. You're not supposed but, to put them down, but yeah. I'd have to put them in my phone just so right. I could remember these silly sure. numbers. And it's all dead time. That's right. not treatment time for a patient mm -hmm. that's in pain or bleeding or ill. And it's not money time for you. You're not well, making money. I'm not seeing patients. I mean, yeah. I, I would be ever... When they started this, and I had to put in my own orders, mm -hmm. I, I tried to go earlier. It didn't ever make it. I was always late to get to the office to see people that were waiting for me. That was terrible. Well, and that's part of what this doctor says in her editorial. She said, if doctors and nurses clocked out when their, time, their shift ended, that mm -hmm. the results on the care of patients would be calamitous. It would be. Because uh, mm -hmm. my son is an ER nurse. Mm -hmm. He works in an emergency room. And he says that he doesn't get off if he's worked 10 hours, 12 hours, mm -hmm. 14 hours mm -hmm. until the other nurses are there to take mm -hmm. it over. But until he's finished all of his paperwork, gotten mm -hmm. everything written down mm -hmm. of what happened overnight, because he mm -hmm. works a night shift, for the people that came in in the middle of the mm -hmm. night. And so he sometimes has a 12-hour day. He sometimes has a 16-hour day. He's paid for a 10- or 12-hour day. Uh -huh. But it's expected, and he expects it of himself because to he cares about what happens to, to the stay patient. And, and try. Stay and get it done. Yeah. So and so he's actually paid by the hospital for a certain number of hours. And norm right. normally, I would think that people would stay and be clocked in. Maybe they can't. I don't think he gets overtime for that. I think he gets. I mean, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know about every hospital is different, as we were discussing. Mm -hmm. So they have different rules. But the point is that the expansion of the day or contraction of the day doesn't directly involve actual patient care. Mm -mm. It involves administrative demands. Right. And and the That's, EMR issue is a governmental issue. I don't know why right. the government dis demanded that we all have EMRs in our offices, that all the hospitals have EMRs, and we had a date of well, like last year. Well, a lot of it started year. in the Clinton administration when they passed the HIPAA laws. And so now we have to have all these... You have why? To have a, no, no, it has nothing. I mean, it would be... This would be an anti-HIPAA because you've got all your information in a computer that somebody can hack and get. When you have a chart... They have to go get your physical chart and look at it. That would be safer for HIPAA. Well, I think the HIPAA is an added extension to the same issue because you, the, the objective being make it possible to computerize all the information and make that accessible by duly authorized people so that if you are treating me here and I'm in Atlanta this afternoon and I have to go to the hospital, they can get that information right away. That would be right great, away. except the computers don't talk to each other. And they didn't, you know, just like government. But I they, think it's the goal. They yeah. didn't say you should all yeah. use this one system. Or, right. You know, they just they just kind of said, okay, you have to have an EMR, but nobody talks to each other. Yeah. So we still have to print off charts, send them by fax, and that's not very secure. Yeah. Or, e or uh, we have to send them by email to another or Thanks. if I go to the emergency room in the middle of the night, I can get them to give me the disc with all the information on it, and I can take it, the, you know, mm -hmm. like the test results. I don't and stuff. have anything that reads a disc in my office. <laughs> I mean, ours we have memory sticks, and we have yeah. 
we have little cards, but we don't have discs. That's so, that's an old and radiology sends me discs, and I can't right, and you read can't it. read it. So then what? <laughs> then I so ask then them to somebody send me whatever. has to spend time time getting figuring out and cross communicating mm-hmm. and make it usable format for you. It's usually paper to help <laughs> me. May, maybe paper, but even so, the, the point I think of the argument is doctors are getting burnt out We're and, sick of and retiring because mm-hmm. the, the jumble of this mm-hmm. and the demand and the chaos of this is so stress enhancing and it isn't what they went to med school to learn to do. Mm-hmm. They're not providing patient care mm-hmm. directly. They're dealing with an administrative behemoth. Yes. And, and, it, and it comes and from costing. everywhere. It's kind of like you're in the middle of this this wheel and all these spokes are throwing things at you. So if I write a prescription for a patient that needs, say, Victoza, very expensive diabetic drug that will actually help them get better and lose weight, I have to write the prescription. The prescription then goes to their pharmacy, who then sends me a letter saying, we can't do this because you have to call your, their insurance company, which then means I have to talk to somebody who's not even a doctor, not a nurse, not a pharmacist, to tell them why I want this patient on Victoza, they go through a little list and say, on their say, computer. And on yeah. their computer right. But first, I have to wait on hold for 20 minutes. Then I get somebody, or right. I mean, some systems are a little better than this, but this is what I usually have to deal with. And then they tell me no. Yeah. And I say, so what else can I do? Well, you'll have to figure that out yourself and go through the same whole, pr- the same process. Yeah. So, how am I supposed to know which drug for which insurance company for which pharmacy? Well, I mean, I shouldn't have to decide on a drug based on what the insurance a patient has. Well, that doesn't I, make sense. I can tell you as a clinician, I got out of the insurance business and went to a cash-based practice because of those fights and arguments with mm-hmm. untrained people mm-hmm. who were looking at a computer program. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if somebody came in that was suicidal mm-hmm. and I had a conversation with their insurance about the authorization for treatment, mm-hmm. I was talking to some some high school graduate mm-hmm. who was looking at a computer programming mm-hmm. at a, at a an listing. algorithm and I had to know what mm-hmm. words they wanted me to say in right. order for the algorithm to say well yeah he can have five sessions and I said How I'm, do not, they I'm know not going to do that five sessions well, is going to be enough because they all their computers tabulate the data and they say the average for this symptom is this uh, so that, so what, what you're seeing is is um, a huge administrative cost yes to save less money than the administration costs. So that's, I've seen stats that say seven or eight out of every dollar spent on health care are spent on the administrative cost. So that three, two or three dollars out of every ten dollars. Okay. Eight dollars are spent on administrative cost. Two dollars are spent on health care. So and it gets worse every year. And so the cost skyrockets, but it's not the medical cost; it's the administrative cost. So what you see is you, the insurance companies work this kind of deal. At first they said, okay, we're going to pay less to the doctor. Then the next year they charge you more. So, so that you have to pay more for your insurance or your employer does the next year, less to the doctor. The following year, this is really interesting. They have people sitting around thinking about how to do this. The next year, your deductible goes up the next year, less to the doctor. The next year you have to pay more for your insurance. So they keep alternating it. So you can't keep track of it. Well, and they're fine. And they are charging so much and making a huge profit and it's not going to matter. And now there's a law that says that hospitals have to post all their prices for everything, but they didn't standardize the language or the cost structure. I didn't know about that. So so they say uh, one hospital will post a description of a coronary process, Mm -hmm. a heart attack. If you have one, this Mm -hmm. is what we we do and this is what it'll cost. But they hide all the costs. They scatter them across the whole spreadsheet. They don't come together and say, if you have a heart attack and you come to our hospital, it'll cost you $1,000. They say this cost a hundred dollars. This cost two hundred dollars. This cost five. So and you if you're looking it. at two or three different, you do, and you have to look at two or three different hospitals if you're checking it out. That say a knee replacement surgery. It doesn't really matter because your insurance company pays them less than half of their charge, so it doesn't matter. The only way it matters is if you're paying cash. Right. But if for you to cash, attempt to do that, you have to get that information to say is this a good place to go, and is your factor that you're considering mm-hmm. cost or Quality. or the experience of the medical care. Right. Because some are better than others. Some doctors are better. Some hospitals are other. Mm-hmm. I mean, you want you want to look at, for instance, the statistics on uh, recidivism. What's the return rate for people that are sent home from the hospital after a procedure because mm-hmm. they got an infection or some additional mm-hmm. complication? Some hospitals have a better rate of return than others. But they, it's not apples and apples because some hospitals <coughs> are in low economic areas, rural areas. Where, or rural areas where yep. people are not necessarily as 
well taken care of or healthy or don't have preventive medicine or have more smoking or have more drinking or have more drugs, you can't look at two hospitals, one one in a um, wonderful part of the city with all the bells and whistles and one that's in the inner city. You can't compare them because people are going to come back to the hospital more if they are sicker. So we're talking about the chaos in the system Mm -hmm. and the stress in the system. And what we're the point we're wanting to make is that the accumulated stress and cost factors are causing doctors to retire earlier, nurses to retire earlier, and they are predicting a crisis mm-hmm. in the availability of care because the people that are trained to provide the care don't want to do it because of all the BS that goes with it. Well, it's hard to find a doctor yeah. here in St. Louis or get in within and six to get months. in within six months. Yeah. So, so I mean. That's already a crisis yeah. unless you if, unless you're already established with the doctor and you're already you're already one of their patients and you have an emergency that they deem an emergency then you can't get in so and, and that's more, an more and more issue. doctors are going to boutique practices stepping out of all these systems and saying here you you and I will contract you pay me so much dollars a year mm-hmm. and that guarantees access to me for this much time mm-hmm. these many interventions well I did what you did I mean my practice yeah. is cash only. That way, I don't have to have three or four billing people to spend right. their you time pay on. Too. Ins- yeah, that I pay salaries yeah. to, and I have to so that they can send your bill to insurance. Right. So that keeps my costs down. It hasn't changed for ten years, and that's not typical. Yeah. But but this is it actually keeps me from having to deal with insurance companies, but it doesn't keep me from dealing with the government, the DEA, the FDA, the uh, right. All of the governmental agencies, and it doesn't keep me from dealing with it, um, some insurance companies just to get a drug I want them to take paid well, for. And I don't want I don't want to be your agent communicating between you and your your insurance company to figure out what you'll get reimbursed right. for. I want to provide the service that I'm trained and licensed to provide, which is like every other business. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and but that but they we had fallen into that because of the way the system evolved uh-huh. and is still evolving i mean to the point that she says the number of administrators have increased 3200% in a in a 15 year and period and they're all trying to keep doctors from spending money well doctors are usually spending money to make you better right. so what they've done so what doctors have done is they've had to decrease the time of their visit. Not me, because I'm outside the system. But right. if the you're paid by insurance, the average is the average time in the doctor's office with the doctor is seven minutes, and that's because to keep his doors open, he or she has to has to have that volume. Have that volume, and and they you can't even I can't say hello in seven minutes. So I mean, but <laughs> getting your story yeah. and getting you a, a diagnosis and treating you, I mean, it's all you can only have one problem at a time. You have to come back the next week. It's not good for people who work. And, and seven minutes is FaceTime with the doctor. The doctor and her physician assistant or nurse, uh, nurse practitioner, practitioner or whatever, or the, or, they're spending another 25, 30 minutes after you've right. left, doing all the paperwork and right. making sure it's right, and then which is you've one got, reason you have to wait so long in the doctor's office. And there's another, and then the insurance people have to work on it. So, right. so of whatever comes in for that visit, it's all portioned out to all of these different overhead things. Yeah, these overhead uh, costs. So that's why it's an issue. Now, I have other people who say, "Well, doctors are all rich." Okay, if I worked at 90 hours being a plumber a week. I would be wealthy. With no education costs. You wouldn't have... I would have no education costs. $250,000, $500,000 in costs. So I'd be wealthier than I am now working yeah. what, at what I do. But I have a different and, I have a and different you wouldn't be any formula. cleaner because you work on plumbing systems too <laughs> yeah, as a gynecologist. I, right. so. As a gynecologist, I spend a lot of time yeah. being yeah, yeah. being a, in the same mess as a plumber. So, right. um, But I mean, if an accountant worked 20, uh, 90 hours a week, right. they're going to make... A lot of money. So it's a matter of time that's spent, maybe not with you, which is the wrong thing. I spend an hour with my patients, and that's what I want to do. And this is why I, I I have this kind of practice. So if there is validity other than our own stress relief and our having <laughs> this conversation, I think it comes down to urging you to be involved in the discussion, to be uh, involved in contacting your politicians, your insurance companies, hospitals, and saying we have to find a way to change the system so that it is again primarily focused on the provision of adequate health care, not on administration, hierarchy, data, paper keeping, and so on. So please and get like, involved. And we'd like you to blame the right people when you're unhappy about your visits yeah. and time and, and that kind of thing or the drug that you can't get because 
even though your doctor called, they said no. I mean, you there's have some to, administrative issues. You have to know, you have yeah. to know who to be, who to direct your um, ire to, right. yeah. and and that's important so that the wrong people aren't blamed. So thank you for listening to As us. As always, today. thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.